Hi, everyone, and thank you for being such a patient audience. We know you're online, and um, I hear that we have quite an audience. If you know anybody who would benefit from this session, kindly nudge them, ping them, just say the session has started so they can join in. My name is Lily Edinamboche, and in a short while, I'll be introducing everybody on this panel to you, and we'll have some people who also give interventions online. We are so thankful for the gift of the internet that allows us to do all of these. And so we want you to stay interactive. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll come back to them as soon as possible. This session is the IGF Workshop 21 and it's titled The Internet Environmental Footprint Towards Sustainability. Our panel is a blend of um, experts or young leaders who essentially have backgrounds and different um, areas related to green technology, clean technology, and also just um, around e-waste and uh, other areas that will be discussed in a short while. So uh, I'll do a bit of what we look to do for our aims of for the aim of this, and then have our panel members do introduction. So we're looking to um, use a hybrid format that is what we have right now, you online, we on site, to get you our conversation. Um, what you're looking to do is to see how. Um, the internet's carbon footprint, also we know that the internet carbon footprint accounts for 3.7% of the global emissions comparable to the, to the airline industry. And this figure is expected to rise. So some of the things we're discussing here is what are alternatives? We are looking in the broad sense of climate, um, um, connecting and the, the, uh, the unconnected in a way that is inherently sustainable. So that is the discussion you're having. So let's start a conversation. I'm going to have start with our panel members on site, and then I'll allow you online to also introduce yourself. So to my left, can you please give us a short introduction? Thank you, Lily, for, for giving us the brief outline. My name is Monojit. I am uh, from India. I have worked on um, internet governance at large. Uh, my PhD topic was uh, finding out the convergence in Discord that probably can be uh, the ways to find out the solution to the debate between the multi-stakeholder and, and the multilateralism. So probably this can be one of the ways. And we would like to get more inputs from the participants uh, online and offline so that we can, because it's uh, mostly about the participation. It's not just uh, you know the one-sided way of uh, telling this. Oh, so thank you. Thank you so much. Like you said, we want the interaction across board. And then to my right, our first panel member. Your turn. Hi, everyone. Um, good evening. I'm Ahita Gangavarapu. I'm from India. I'm coordinator of Youth IGF India and also a board member of uh, ITU Generation Connect. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you, Lily. Um, and I have a background in uh, tech, um, you know, have experience working with Internet of Things across multiple applications in smart cities. And in this uh, regard, I've come across this particular p persistent, this issue of um, environment uh, footprint. And I'm really glad to be, you know, have the opportunity to share some insights shortly. Thank you so much. And then to Carson. Hello. So Jambo Salams, my name is Carson Gabriel. I'm from Tanzania, computer scientist, and uh, I have a background in internet governance for almost six years now. Uh, I am part of the African Youth IGF, and uh, particularly we are here to explore the role of the multi-stakeholder approach, something that we have been all raised on, and how we use this element to create sustainability, especially towards a more progressive humanity that uses energy not only in terms of uh, consumption, but also creating more diverse bridges for the next generation to enjoy. Thank you. And then we also have our online participants. Um, what I forgot to add before was that we have Carson who will be co-moderating also with me. Um, for our, our online panel, panel members, if you are on, that is Innocent and also Jauri, let's start with you, Innocent. And Annette too, yes. So Innocent, the floor is yours, a short introduction. We go to Jauri and then to Annette. Yes, so Annette, if you can hear us, please. Introduce yourself. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the platform. Uh, good evening. Good morning. Good actually a few minutes to afternoon from Kenya, and uh, I am an African youth, <laughs> passionate and interested in internet governance, and I am happy to contribute to these discussions, uh, and I'll also be your rapporteur for the session. You are welcome, and thank you for having us. 
Thank you so much, Annette. So excited to have you. So in a short while, the conversation is going to shift to Carson, who is going to walk us through some guiding questions. Um, but we're going to take turns to discuss how the issue of climate sustainability relates to us and the work we do. And because of we haven't to leave, unfortunately, I will give a bit of context and then hand over to Carson to have the conversation kick-started. So initially, I mentioned my name is Lily. I live and I was born in Ghana and currently doing a PhD in IT at the University of Cincinnati. Now, I'll give you the context uh, or how sustainability pretty much aligns with the work I do and my experience with it. First, as a Ghanaian, uh, I live in Ghana and one of the places that has been tagged as the world's largest dump site for e-waste is Agboboloshi, a place that is found in Accra. And one of the things that we saw growing up was how people would carry scraps or, or break apart e-waste to be able to find valuable metals, go out there and sell to people in the hopes of making money. So what people saw as trash for people in Agboboloshi, it was treasure. And the way that these materials were broken apart and the way that they were recycled to be able to to be able to get these precious materials in there was not done in a way that was environmentally friendly. These were people who only knew that they had to break apart some of these because they had to make a livelihood and they had to sell. So the issue of Abu Bulushi became um, one of the hot topics in Ghana and some interventions came from the government of Ghana in collaboration with GIC, that's the German um, corporation um, arm of, GIL, of, of, of the German government. So what, what happened was a, 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 a time of pretty much creating awareness of how uh, some of the activities that uh, probably if e-waste was not done, recycling was not done in a good way, would harm the environment. It took, or it still takes a lot of, um, I mean, education and awareness creation for people who make who do some of these uh, recycling as a livelihood to see reason as to why they should do it in a way that is pretty much sustainable. Um, but that is just something that is currently ongoing, and uh, essentially, it will take maybe some time to get people to understand the why. And when we are talking about connecting people, we want to see even how we can explore refurbishing some of these e-ways for um, communities that are underserved. And that is also pretty much an issue that we see in Accra and across Ghana. There are places that don't have access. One of the biggest hindrance is access to devices. So if um, these devices probably had a home where they could be refurbished and redistributed, who knows, they wouldn't end up in dump sites to be um, recycled in such a way that it's in the long run affects or uh, negatively impacts the environment. So some of the things that I'm seeing uh, from research and uh, because I'm doing a research, I did a, my, my, my master's thesis in e-waste, was essentially how uh, across the US, there are cities that have implemented in their inclusion strategies some things related to e-waste management. And uh, I will also switch from the context of Ghana to the US. So the best practice that is a recommendation that some of the cities could implement, it's actually city level, uh, is that the inclusion strategies that look at refurbishing, redistribution, and reuse. All these three R's are in such a way that it, it, it is uh, contributing to making sure that all of the things that are uh, probably dark that always do not end up in the dam sites and probably would find a home with people who probably would use it also for their work or just to make or, or just to learn for like students who need um, access to devices. In essence, these best practices can only come to uh, fruition if there are resources for gathering this e-waste, housing them, if there were skilled aspects to repair them, and if there was a way, a program or something to be able to redistribute them. So in essence, uh, my perspective is from the e-waste angle, where I look at alternative to connectivity through e-waste refurbishment, and it's because of the background I have with the, with the story I just shared about the case of Abu Bulushi, and what it is that I found out that cities are implementing by way of e-waste strategies in their inclusion strategies in the U.S. And um, some of these cities, they are tagged the trailblazer cities, and they are usually... Um, they have reports that reports um, that that um, sends out what it is that they are doing that people can also implement for their own context, and it's something that others can replicate and customize for their own situation. So I know probably there are questions or something comments that can come uh, from this submission. 
I'll drop it here and then hand the floor to hand over the floor to Carson, who would give us some more nudges and guiding questions to drive the conversation towards the aim of the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lily. And that was quite interesting what you shared. The local con context and concept of what Ghana does. Well, let me start with the simple crisis question. What is the solution to a problem if the solution is the problem? Because when I think of climate change now and the internet and everything, that is where I lie. And I, that was the context when we were discussing about this session. It is a high quality question that we really need to discuss. And we, I believe here, all of us have a lot to discuss. There is the climate change agenda and there is the climate reality. Now, when we live in the fourth industrial revolution, when we have an intersection of energy, transportation, and communication technologies highly embedded with the internet, I believe that the internet could do more rather than contribute to the 3.6 uh, percentage of emissions that are happening. So I would like to start with you, Dr. Monojit. If you'd like to share your context towards our obligation today, what do you think the people want to hear and what is the, is the agenda behind in trying to create an internet that's sustainable and serves its purpose to the people? Okay, thank, thank you, Gabriel. Uh, uh, my understanding, I'd like to share about my understanding because I may not be the uh, whole and soul of internet or what exactly, but I'd like to share uh, about my understanding. You see, uh, there may be different stakeholders out here, uh, whether it's the government, academia, you know, the civil society, but if we try to uh, go deeper into a little bit, you know, if you see government, government is actually dependent on the civil society for votes, and the civil society is de dependent upon the technical society, uh, technical companies or uh, the big giants for funding, because they don't have their own. And if you go to academy, you still need a subsidized uh, funding from the government. So everyone is, you know, somehow or the other interrelated with each other. We cannot deny that. So whenever we are going to a civil society events or so that talks about free speech or anything, it is some or the other the company has their own agenda behind it and whether you accept or not. So, uh, and if you see if the countries, those who have the, trying to develop their own uh, internet in terms of, you can say the censorship or building up of the firewalls or anything as such, this is just trying to uh, frame a security layer of their own so that, you know, internet, uh, the whole concept, I believe, was introduced when it was as a preventive measure uh, I, I, under the DARPA or the, that was a military thing altogether, it was all about. So, uh, so everyone has their own interest and I believe that it will continue. It, it's an unending, but probably there can be some sort of convergence on the topics that can be uh, worked upon together without, without any differences. And uh, that is although where we all come together, that we have all agreed that environment can be the one. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, because here you don't have any differences. Every stakeholder will, will agree. Because in the morning when you send good morning, it is not just the good morning text that is taking one KB of your data. But at the same time, it is coming going through a lot of submarine cables because we are not having a dedicated satellite for us. So we are using those d data centers to say, you know, power your or save, uh, save your images. And it takes a lot of energy. So this energy is not coming from, you know, uh, most of the cases, although Microsoft and other uh, companies are there saying that they have been trying to, you know, put it under water, but it's not all 100%, you know. So what we have tried to uh, find out is that there can be probably some areas where uh, we all can collaborate in this, between this debate of multi-stakeholder and multilateralism is to come up and promote energy efficiency. And that when we talk about, it can be uh, largely on the devices as uh, my co-panelist also mentioned, Lily, about the e-waste. You know, utilizing e-waste has been, you know, she has already elaborated, I don't want to, because she has explained in a very better way. Uh, the transition to renewable um, energy, because uh, powering data centers, you know, it requires a lot of energy. So instead, if you can harness the solar power, uh, you know, using the solar panels or the wind, any such that, you know, all the scientists, uh, experts are there. And in terms of when I say the uh, regulatory measures, and there, can, uh, there are regulatory measures that, you know, have a moderation or uh, in, the, in terms of using of the contents, what to, to be, but in terms of using of the resources, there cannot, there can be a uniformity. Everybody can agree on this point. And uh, particularly when we talk about the submarine cables that act optimal, you know, data, we have to be dependent on someone or the other because we as an individual, 
uh, there's always debate between the security and privacy. That uh, initially I was a student and still now I'm a student of uh, security studies, so I understand on the perspective of security much better. Uh, either, you know, there is a debate we have to give up our security uh, or for privacy. Because we cannot ask for privacy when we don't have our own utility. For using the social media, we're still dependent on the social media platform to give us an opportunity to convey our message. So here, what we can do is that, uh, that these submarine cables, when they are laid, it should be laid. Now, more and more cables are being laid on. At least we can focus that these do not disrupt, uh, disrupt the coral reefs or particularly it doesn't pass through the sensitive areas where the rich sources of, you know, the uh, marine animals are there. So uh, this can be a little bit of the areas where we can all collaborate. And then the rest, you know, the debate can continue. And I'm sure many of us, we all don't know that Everything, you know, the debate between the multi-stakeholder has to continue for long because it, it is an unending process. And with this, I'd like to say uh, thank you uh, to the moderator and please can uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Monojit. And uh, I believe we live in one world, one sun, the same air we breathe together. So this is something that it is for us. It is people-centered. It is a people problem. And uh, there are so many solutions we've heard, like using satellites and high-altitude uh, connectivity devices to help mitigate the risks of the climate change and climate agenda as brought by internet connectivity. So if we pivot to solutions, let me go to you, Ihita, coming from India, uh, a place where you actually feel climate change, but it's also quite technologically progressive. What are the solutions do you think that might contribute in creating an eco-friendly and green sustainable internet? Well, thank you so much, and I think great points by all of my panelists here today. <coughs> Excuse my voice, I have a sore throat. Um, so, um, you know, when we are looking at technology and r connecting it to environment, you tend to think about how it's affecting environment, right? But one major component, or maybe I would say one um, a different lens would be how do we leverage technology uh, to... Um, let's say, monitor various environmental parameters, monitor and track them, and also add intelligence to it so that when we conduct research, come up with standards and regulations, all data-backed. Um, so in that context, I just want to talk about my personal experience working with Internet of Things, IoT technology, um, back in India, working on smart cities. We were looking at, um, you know, IoT-enabled smart cities in India, where we were looking at multiple verticals or multiple use cases around air pollution monitoring, energy monitoring, water quality monitoring. Um, and it is not just from a city perspective, even at a, in a small room, how can you monitor the CO2 levels? Um, and even in the kitchen of the households, we had placed IoT sensors and we were able to find out the kind of food that was b being prepared and what was the carbon footprint of that particular um, let's say, type of bread that is being prepared in the kitchen. <laughs> so um, I feel like the issue gets worse um, of, you know, the issue of carbon uh, footprint, you know, it's becoming worse. If we don't have accurate measures of determining the emissions derived from certain processes, products, services, and technologies, I think that is where I want to bring in IoT. So when you talk about Internet of Things, it's all of these technologies, um, it's internet of all dumb things. That's how I, I would explain. Um, you have your smart refrigerators, you have baby, uh, baby monitors, all of these items uh, are connected to the internet and they, are sens they have sensors that monitor various parameters, send it over the network, and then you have a lot of data from all of these IoT devices. Um, one really interesting use case would be having IoT in an agricultural domain to monitor, let's say, the soil moisture. Um, and that, and you can have IoT for monitoring the health of a forest also. You can also predict uh, when a forest uh, fire is likely to happen, right? So all of these are really important applications of IoT that help you have data-backed results and uh, actions. Um, when you look at smart cities, IoT enables smart cities particularly, they also help you with urban planning, smart waste management, um, and uh, traffic management. Right? So these are some aspects that might not necessarily seem relevant in a local context, but at a global context, they have a lot of impact on the carbon footprint. And another important aspect I want to highlight upon is uh, the importance of environmental compliance. 
right? Every um, country, every region might have their own set of issues um, or factors contributing to the footprint. But compliance uh, or having uh, global standards is really important. Um, back in India, I've seen people uh, talk about, or let's say um, NGOs or even big organizations talk about how cost uh, is a factor, and then that is why they don't, uh, let's say, follow environment-friendly services or products. So having global standards around this will help you ha streamlining certain processes so the cost itself does not no, no longer stands as a barrier. I think that's the thought process that I wanted to share with all of you. Um, I'll, I'll hand it over to Carson now. Thank you very much, Ahita. And you mentioned a very key element of having evidence fact-based mechanisms. And I got something which you said. We have to develop a mechanism to have clean traffic. How can we measure the clean traffic of the internet? Because that can be a source that can help us guide the study and the research that needed. Because now there is so much centralization when it comes to technology and the climate change. And I believe the only solution is having grassroots voices. Because in the end, people, processes, and platforms are the things when they are connected help in mitigating these issues. And I'm really happy to see you all, the multi-stakeholder approach with all your voices here. The climate debate can be sorted when we all speak. So I would like to welcome you, our dear audiences, to share your remarks, to share your questions, and most importantly, just share your voices, because I think we owe it to the next generation to be accountable so that there can be an internet 100 years from now. One Earth, one internet. Let's protect it. So please, audience, we are open to your remarks. Maybe Mr. Edmund Chung might have something to add, right? Let me give you the mic. <laughs> Thank you for call. Oh, hello. Um, thank you for calling me on. Uh, this is Edmund Chung from Dot Asia. Um, I think it's it's a great conversation, and it's a conversation that, especially as uh, uh, last speaker mentioned, uh, it is a conversation that can make a difference from younger participants and uh, uh, from the youth. Um, one of the things that I, I guess I would just add to this, um, I think how we. Um, what the narrative is and how we think about measuring the eco-friendliness of the internet infrastructure is something that is very important. And actually, uh, for Dot Asia, we have been working on this since uh, 2020 with the uh, with APNIC Foundation, um, and actually come to our booth and we have this eco internet. Asia uh, report, or you can check it online, ecointernet.asia. And what we did was uh, exactly as um, was discussed is the, the, the concept that it's the, the internet not only, of course the internet has its own carbon footprint and, and you know, has its own impact on, on climate change, but what about the, the positive impact? How do we think about that? Um, and that's sort of what the Eco Internet Index was trying to do. Um, and this is the first year we are releasing kind of a ranking between different jurisdictions, between different countries, how eco-friendly the internet infrastructure is. Um, we look at three axes. Uh, one is on economy, and we look at the uh, balance, or I guess the replacement of digital economy versus the old, more carbon heavy uh, economy and then the energy access uh, really the 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 energy source that powers the internet and then the third area which you touched on just a little bit as well is the network efficiency the network itself can also be uh, more efficient um, so beyond the ranking one of the things that are more relevant to this uh, uh, this conversation we are having is also what are the things that can be done right I mean as users, as young people, uh, maybe the uh, policy intervention are going to be important, but I think a, a, a grassroots movement to, to actually make this uh, awareness that we can be more carbon conscious uh, users of the internet and call for you know, data centers to be uh, using more renewable energy. Um, also, one key um, kind of finding in, in the report that we found uh, really interesting is that digital inclusion that is a lot about talked about here at IGF 
actually comes hand in hand with sustainability because the re most remote places, um, it's better to use solar energy, it's better to use off-grid energy and build that capacity uh, rather than you know, try to build uh, the, the, the more carbon heavy way into the remote areas. So in fact, these are things that can, I guess, jumpstart people's awareness and consciousness that, that you know, how the network itself and the infrastructure actually has an impact, but the network itself can also help. Um, and the balance between them is, is kind of what we want to achieve and the conscious, being conscious about it is, is very important. Thank you very much. Phoebe? So uh, the submission was spot on, and it got me to remember something that came from the 2019 main session on environment, and it was how some somebody had um, mentioned that there was, uh, like, like you shared, that uh, outlook or people's interest to see how we can use technology, in essence, to solve climate issues. And in the longer we have uh, the issue of technology contributing to what it is that we're trying to solve, right? And that's always a dilemma that people are trying to, like, how do we balance and all of that? But that conversation had steered from the angle that there has been for, uh, for the longest of time a focus on the economic angle of technology, like how technology can foster development, how it can bring profit. And there was that part of, uh, um, there was ver little to no consideration for sustainability and how we can essentially, there's another angle that was mentioned, there were three of them, but it got us to see that there is a need for people or, I mean, everybody involved to reconsider what it is that uh, we, we focus on for like technology beyond its use to see how it can also impact, uh, I mean, the world we live in, right? So beyond profit, what else? So that continuous focus on economic angle for the longest of time didn't um, help. And so the impact part is something that's, uh, the impact both positive and negative is uh, a part where we would, 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 would want to consider looking at again and also would consider seeing how we can um, use or leverage technology for um, building sustainability. While I say this, there's been a question that has come in the chat and I'll read it because I'm co-moderating with <laughs> Kassan to be able to steer the conversation towards those lines. So somebody, that's Keja from Ghana, had said that some of these solutions articulated in the past um, that have been spearheaded by government are quite historic and doesn't take into an account a bottom-up approach. How do we bridge the gap then? There's a question for us. So well, thank you. Thank you, Kaiga. Mm -hmm. um, First of all, just to add on that, I believe we are caught in the mis- and disinformation of what the climate agenda is. And this is due to poor quality data that most of our governments have, not fact-checked. And I'd like to thank Edmund Chung, who just provided a lot of solutions which are grassroots. So when we bridge that grassroots and governmental conversation, I think, which can be brought by the multi-stakeholder approach, it could be a mechanism to build on that. But uh, I would also like to call on Dr. Monojit because you have some experience working with government and academia. What are your points on this question? Uh, thank you. Uh, the particularly in this point, like, you know, it, it has to start from somewhere. So probably that somewhere can be us, and that is although the reason you see that all the individuals uh, in, in this uh, panel you see, we, we are also associated into many things like when it comes to security, uh, she has spoken on artificial intelligence, she spoke again on security, privacy. But we feel that this is something, the environment, that there should be, you know, as, as a contribution to the society and the environment that where we are living in. We can try to bring out a little bit from our time to take in the efforts to not just the networking we are doing outside this, but also actually on ground to find out that where can be the synergies to collaborate and find out that why the dilemma that exists between the actual implementation on ground and on, on paper. So here, you know, there are two terms, as I mentioned, that why the debate between the multi-stakeholder and the multilateral, it, it exists. And if you relate that it will continue to exist still long, I don't know whether IGF will like it or not, but it's actually here to stay because there are differences, you know and which is not going to be very easy to solve, but on this particular lines, as we, uh, we discussed that, we were finding out that how much internet was, uh, you know, communication was sent between, that we can be started from basically friend A to friend B. Whether, whether my home is net, you know, compliance, is having the compliance of environmental friendly or not, 
So in this way, you know, where it is going, going to be sent, you know, whether his or her house or the gender they follow. So is that having the same, you know, carbon neutral policy or not? So this can be some sort of a step, probably some ideas you know, from there can be derived and it can be then implemented because internet also, the world we are connecting today did not happen it one together. It all started in a small lab, probably little bigger than this with different computers. So now it has moved across the state and the sometime other places also we are connecting. So this, I probably this can be just the start and we can be the change. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I'd like to go to Anet. Much has been spoken about policy and the role of policy in mitigating our crisis here. Anet, if you'd like to share, because Kenya is a country that is quite a pioneer in terms of circular economy, and this is built on the traditions there. Uh, just a fun fact, it comes from the Maasai culture. The Maasai culture is a form of people and traditions who are quite incredible in their ingenuity and the use of indigenous processes to cultivate circular economy based on their mechanisms. And I believe there is where we can get the solution. So, Anet, you have five minutes to share your points, if you can hear me. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Carson, for the opportunity. And for me, uh, I would really like to maybe shift the discussion a little bit and also give an example of Kenya. And uh, first and foremost, um, last month, uh, September, we had the Africa Climate Summit happening uh, in Kenya. And uh, one of the call to action items was, uh, and I quote, a call to access to and transfer of environmentally sound technologies including technologies that consist of processes and uh, innovation methods to support Africa's green industrialization and transition. And uh, that, was, that was just a step in the right direction in recognizing that, uh, you know, uh, tackling the internet's environmental footprint is key in uh, driving the key agenda. And this is therefore a call to, you know, collaboration and cooperation of all uh, different stakeholders uh, in tackling the the digital footprint. And also, uh, it's often said that we are uh, creatures of habit. We also should question what we can do at individual levels to uh, tackle uh, our own internet environmental footprint. Uh, for example, uh, are we always, uh, you know, buying new gadgets? Are we, are we creatures of trends? Or uh, do we focus on functionality and uh, those are just some of the mitigation efforts that we can use uh, to reduce the internet's environmental footprint. Thank you. Thank you very much. You talked about inclusivity, and that is key. Well, since I like putting people on the spot, Ernest, Ernest, you're quite potent in the field of standardization. So what can standardization aid in terms of mitigating the risk of the internet that's sustainable? Please, Ernest. Thank you very much, Kassan. You caught me off guard on there. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, I, I liked what uh, Hita said about the uh, carbon footprint, measuring the carbon footprint. I think that's what I'm going to focus. So I believe this is one of the very important aspects that standards can play in measuring the uh, providing a consistent framework uh, uh, to establishing um, and quantifying reports on uh, methodology, methodologies and data collections on how we can measure the carbon footprints and other um, issues. So I believe that uh, by following these standards organization, we can e effectively track um, and manage their carbon emission, identify areas of improvement, and uh, have informed decision. For example, we have um, various standards that talk about environmentability. Uh, I'm sure um, most of you know about ITU. You can just go to ITU T standard on environmentability. We have standards that talk about um, issues to deal with um, climate change and also and how we are um, mitigating the issues of uh, d data and how we're spending the data on the internet and also just our internet footprint and how we are using the internet and everything. So I, I believe standards plays a role in uh, shaping an, an inclusive policy on how best we can uh, shape our environment to be more sustainable and eco-friendly. 
Yes. So, uh, in, and the other thing that I would also like just to suggest is that uh, collaboration in everything is key. We have a private sector, we have a civil society, we have the technical community, and we have a government. So it's best that we collaborate together to, to shape one ideology and one agenda to ensure that the internet becomes more sustainable. Because we can talk about the environmental friendly, but we have the experts from the technical community who can provide us insights on the best ways on how we can do it. We've got civil society who can provide uh, the awareness aspect and also reaching out to many numbers and masses. And also we've got the private sector who have got the infrastructure and also the technology at the end of the day. And we've got government who can provide policies and also like they have the final say, they have the plumbers. Some of us, we're just, uh, <laughs> we are pipes, but they have the plumbers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So um, we're going to come back online for anybody who has a question or a contribution. But uh, because we want to hear your recommendations also, we'll pass a microphone around in a bit. Uh, before we do that, we are going to ask Ahita to also respond to the question around how to bridge the gap, um, especially when government initiatives aren't um, doing what they, what they have to do. And how do we bridge the gap, as was asked by Keja online. Actually, that's a really important question for us to think about. I'm not sure if we have like a definite answer that will just go into action right away, but there's something that we should all think about and uh, discuss. The first thing that comes to my mind, um, looking at all of you in the room, is co co consultations, right? You're looking at um, different stakeholders coming together and discussing on um, where do we start, right? Every small or a big effort will have definitely have a good or a bad impact. So we're looking at a good impact in terms of reducing the footprint, making sure our environment is sustainable, it's healthy. Um, but what, what is a realistic start for us, I think is that's something we have to all ideate on and consultations that, let's say, a government facilitates in their country, making sure the private sector comes together, civil society come together. Those developing technologies from a design point of view itself are incorporating in their supply chain, in their products, uh, environmentally conscious processes, right? So I think consultations is one. Um, the second point I'm... I think is um, in terms of cost, right? I, like I mentioned in my previous message is that cost is a factor or is considered as a barrier for people to develop environmentally conscious services and technologies. So incentives from the governments to the private sector or those who are making an effort uh, to reduce the footprint, I think is that's another point I'd like to highlight. Um, and. And we, um, all of us sitting here individually, also have a role to play, right? We have to be conscious ourselves as to what our daily activities, how are they contributing to the global environment? Um, how, what is the type of effect that it's, it's creating? Is it, uh, is it a bad rippling effect? Uh, how, how are we propagating this? So, uh, and I really like that Ernest mentioned uh, standards. He took an example of ITU standards for environment. And I think standardization is the third aspect uh, because a lot of uh, standards, not just at a multilateral level, also multi-stakeholder organizations coming together to develop standards. So I think that is where um, an echo of how um, t environmentally sound decisions need to be made in the digital space come together. So I think, yeah, those are my inputs. Thank you so much for sharing, Ahita. And um, we're going to start hearing from you. Is there anyone who has um, heard, read, experimented, or probably uh, just learned of a, of a best practice uh, with, with regards to sustainability in the case of technology that would want to share? If you'd want to, by all means, put up your hand, and I'll reach you with a microphone. So we want to, as much as possible, also learn from you and if there was anything that has worked in any context that you know of, please let us know and we can add it to the recommendations that we have. So any idea whatsoever, you can put up your hand and I'll give you the microphone. <laughs> right, would you even have a question? You have a question for the panel maybe? No, <laughs> right. Um, anybody wants to contribute to this conversation so far? Actually, and we welcome the professors. So, oh, the professor, right. We'd want to add to uh, Though I came a little late, but I really appreciate I have been interacting with you from last two days. 
and I really appreciate the uh, perception and the efforts which you are putting for the sustainable cyberspace. So I think uh, it's hats off to you and uh, Lily, Dr. Monajit, Bram, Ihita, all are working great hard for this thing. So I think asking a question to all of you would be a challenging part for me also because everything is so fine and filtered. Thank you. Right, okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, thanks for, I mean, coming to support you. I appreciate you um, and the friendship. Uh, anybody want to ask a question about sustainability in terms of technology, green technology, clean technology, clean energy? Um, you can put up your hand and ask, or if you have a submission, a recommendation, you can also put up your hand and I can give you the microphone to share. We have, all right, okay. No, we are all addicted to hydrocarbons, sadly, <laughs> and this is something that powers all. In this situation, there are things which work and things which do not work. So our session is mostly about listening to all of you. So I will pass the mic to each and every one of you just for 30 seconds. Tell us, what is that one idea do you think we can work on? Because this is a small group and this is where change happens. So please respectfully, just one thing share with us, beginning here. No, I, I, I think the, um, not a lot of idea to, to add to it because uh, we are uh, working on it as well and we want to listen. Um, but I think a way to, um, the, the narrative and the measurement is really important. And if we can come up with a way to really talk about this, and uh, I think that would be important. But I would encourage you to, tomorrow morning, there's gonna be a main session on environment, which we will be talking about this, um, uh, 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 you know, in, in, the, in the plenary hall. So I do encourage you to bring some of this discussion there and, and ask those experts there. Um, actually, I'll be moderating that session as well, but uh, please bring this, today's ideas there. Now I will pass, help you pass. Hey everyone speak, so um, so hi, I'm Jasmine. Uh, I'm with Atman actually from Dot Asia, Hong Kong. Um, I don't know what should I say, maybe something I, um, well, um, I'm not sure with the terms, but like um, there's uh, some solution that I would like to share. It's actually for uh, more about sustainable housing solution. So there's uh, one startup in Hong Kong called AMPD Energy. So what they've been, um, uh, they're using some kind of special uh, materials and also technology to reduce the carbon footprint and also emission when it comes to, you know, like um, that kind of um, um, transactional housing things and also uh, warehouse uh, boxes. So it's, it's a, I forget because I'm not an expert, so I do not how to, I, I forget the term how to name the materials, but I'm just calling AMPD energy because I have been, um, uh, kind of like uh, talking with them before. Um, so this is one of the good case that I would love to share, um, especially housing, you know, as you guys know, it's, it's a quite a um, serious problem in Hong Kong. So definitely we want to reduce more carbon footprint and also uh, impacts uh, when it comes to housing materials and infrastructure. So that's just a little thing that I could contribute. <laughs> I, I, I just think about it. So I'll just pass my mic to younger generation. <laughs> Also from Hong Kong. <laughs> hey, uh, I'm from Hong Kong. All right, so uh, my name is Ethan. So I'm from the One Pile Foundation. Um, so uh, this uh, foundation actually aims to reduce paper waste and give books second lives by um, doing book crossing in internet methods. So uh, actually, we have already some results in one year since it's actually a pretty new uh, idea, or uh, you can say, or a company, and. Uh, I think, and we will have a lightning talk on Wednesday, so if you guys uh, are uh, free to join, uh, we are well, we're very welcome you to join. <laughs> yep, and <laughs> yeah, that's all. Oh, okay. Hello, thank you for your uh, invitations. I'm Danny, also from Wampao, from Hong Kong, and, uh, and uh, we have, uh, actually we have the same group 
from uh, uh, doing the IoT, uh, solving the uh, book reusing uh, scenario. And uh, after having your uh, joint decision, this session uh, about uh, how to build a sustainability environment, I have some, uh, some, some point to share what I have encountered in Hong Kong. Because everybody wants to talk about sustainability, talk about protective environment, but uh, when you when you when you going to want to want to implicate it, you will find that you always need to have a business model, and you have, you always have to raise funds. You always have to someone who can uh, who who will give you money, but if you really want to just raise raise one or the money is come from government, it's always have a it's always very difficult. So I find that uh, many many people have the awareness to protect the environment, have some initiative. But to the final round, no money, no business to support. When you go into the business, they always want you to, to make some impact. But the impact is not social impact. It's about the business impact. So I think it's, it, it is a gap to bridge between the commercial, the commercial world and the sustainability initiative. And uh, I believe, so that's why we are here. I believe when we have uh, some synergy, we have to develop many, many kind of synergy to make it possible, to make the ESG environment possible. Uh, if just one initiative, I think it's always hard to, hard to, hard to drive because no one, no financial support always. So uh, that's what I encounter and want to share with you all, you all and I hope we can have some synergy or uh, whatever ESG pro uh, solutions. Thank you. Oh, hello. Uh, we come from the same group. So uh, because Danny has already mentioned about uh, the things that happen in our um, company, but I want to address some uh, situations that the, the world may not know about Hong Kong because uh, sometimes people will think maybe Hong Kong is a well-developed cities, but in terms of the SDGs, uh, we have a very slow pacing of growth because right now we are just doing things like, okay, recycle the bottles and recycle the can and recycle the paper and that's it. So what we are coming over is how we make use of the technology and then how to make the sustainable uh, the path move forward. So that's why uh, we come here to absorb uh, the technology, uh, the method or the works have been done over the world so we can bring it back and then give some, uh, provide some solutions to maybe the government or maybe even uh, how can we promote it within Hong Kong to uh, chase it, uh, the, the steps of how the world is working on. So these are my kind of thought that we, we would like to share with you. Thanks. Okay, then uh, <laughs> thank you for giving the mic. Um, so I need to present myself. I, I just uh, do research at University of Namur. I'm Naomi Bontrader. And um, yeah, I was just hearing a bit earlier at uh, the main session on artificial intelligence. Uh, I was hearing set Center saying, uh, you must use the most powerful tools to address the most powerful, powerful issues. Uh, including uh, climate change uh, issues. Uh, in my opinion, it's al always uh, interesting to point out that, of course, there are some um, uh, possible um, um, uh, possibilities with AI to address issues uh, like climate change, but we always need to stress that uh, it has an impact uh, on climate change. And then uh, a question could be, uh, shouldn't we wait and research first on uh, reducing the impact of AI before uh, trying to develop these technologies to address the issues? So that uh, would be a question for you, actually. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you for. <laughs> right. 
Um, thank you. I'm also, um, I'm my name is Terry, and I'm also from Wen Hao, from Hong Kong, so I skipped the part. Um, actually, from um, from the speech, from the talk, um, you all, um, I'm always thinking about the question is, what can I do? Like, what can me as a youth, as a youth from the other side, um, can do, can contribute to the to the youth, to the people in the global south in Africa, because we, as we know that we are facing different situation of digital technology, for example, digital inclusion. In Hong Kong, we are, although we have uh, the most advanced access and also um, availability of internet, but um, our digital literacy actually is not very high. But in Africa, in the maybe in the global south, is another situation. Maybe you are still, maybe you are still um, working on how to get the digital devices. So um, this is a lesson, or maybe is a question for me to think about: What can I do for you? For what can I do for the other side of the whole world? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So we have two questions right now. We have the, the first one on, shouldn't we be researching more on AI to see how a, the impact of AI wouldn't ne uh, negatively impact the environment before we develop it more? Thus, how do we make sure that AI is serving us and serving us well and not contributing to the issue? Uh, one of the things that I think Enes hinted was around policies. Usually when we say policies, it feels so far-fetched, but it's some of the recommendations that we give to government for them to be able, for, for them to, be able to see why they may be an, a, a disadvantage to something that they deploy as technology. And I see that uh, because technology is fast evolving, one of the things that we, we, we usually would see is uh, it just re really fast outpaces policy. People uh, adapt technologies, probably do not even have the basic infrastructure in place, um, how to make sure that it is de deployed within the confines that protect humans and within the confines that can make it beneficial to society. So it's what we're seeing as a problem. Policies that ensure that uh, there is the right deployment, right usage, sometimes are missing. And the process for building policy is sometimes bureaucratic, so lengthy, it's not uh, swift and to, act, uh, to implement. And so for, for, for a long time, the disadvantage will be felt before there is a curative approach to addressing it. It's usually not uh, done before things happen. Nobody thinks of it till it's really an issue, and that's what we are seeing. So if there were policy that probably were even global, that people are learning from, countries are adapting and, and, and uh, customizing for their context to be able to deploy AI for environmental protection, for climate change um, um, uh, initiatives, who knows, it will probably be helpful. So my, my first thought goes towards policy because it helps us to be able to create a certain kind of guiding principles for how some of these technologies are deployed. With, you can add to it, right? So Ahita also wants to add to the point. Yeah, thanks, Lily. Um, so she has given a policy uh, dimension to it, and I think it's really important. As she said, it's guiding principles. Um, but when you're looking at AI, I think it's definitely here to stay, right? So, and we are already, I think, past where I, I don't know. We still use the term emerging technology. I think it's quite emerged now, <laughs> and uh, quite integral part of. Um, basically everyday life, especially those who have, um, let's say, the, use the services regularly. Um, but in cybersecurity, we use the term security by design. So can we have something similar when it comes to environment, right? Can we have something environmentally conscious by design? Like, I think it's a great question because at the very starting of a supply chain when you're designing, de then comes development, then maybe comes you are deploying it. Can we have something there? And I think that is where if you have policies starting right at the beginning of coming up with the technology itself, um, then the whole chain itself is very conscious um, and to what could be the repercussions of not following a particular policy on the carbon footprint. And that's the kind of thought process that I have. Um, be happy to add more to it, but given the time, I think I will hand it over to the moderators. In addition, as one thing, like uh, you know, you mentioned a question that whether we, we should first focus on how much you know potential or how much threat can AI pose to us, then we can think on the extension part. 
I don't know. It it is an unending because you see, in few months back, the very top CEOs decided, you know, we should stop researching on AI for six months. Probably that was in the news going around. But did they stop working? Did the company stop? No, they didn't stop. So it's like you know, they're working and they want others to stop. You know, so at least they want to be on the advantage side. That's what I feel. So first of this is a parallel thing because unless and until we research more to what extent we can go, we cannot find out the, what can be the drawbacks. We, we, it, it should be parallel, you know. We have to build a house, then we can find whether it's earth resistant or not. Unless you can shake it, uh, because before that you can't make a two story and then think whether the six story will fall or not. We have to build the six story and then probably we can shake it to see whether it falls or not. So <laughs> that's. I like the analogy at the end with a two story and it's a story. Like you've got to test it to see if that's interesting. Um, there's, there was a second question actually, and she said, What can I do? Right? We're talking about sustainability. And the question is, What can we as individuals do? I think we've been demanding from different stakeholder groups. The question is, What can we do? I would start from the awareness creation. So you've had something from here, you want to go and uh, probably just, you can use the social media. That seems sometimes like uh, very little, but if it were consistent and continuous and creates awareness and uh, probably uh, in such a way that people are seeing, then people get to know that there's an issue and there is a, a demand for some hearing for people to take some action. So I would take that angle. I know some others would want to add to it. So for me, I feel like one of the things that people would need to be able to swing into action is a knowledge. And for you who know, you'll be the knowledge sharer you be the one to create awareness and help people to swing into action. I would have want, um, who wants to add something? What can Maybe individuals time, do? So mm -hmm. Thank you very much for those contributions. All I want to say is uh, what we should do is an important question. Be bold, be vocal, be accountable. It's one internet, it's one world. The solutions are here. We need to provide solution digital leadership. And I'm so happy from our colleagues from Hong Kong and all the room who share this perspective. It shows how much we are connected, the internet, interconnected networks, but behind those nodes are people. And the solutions are always people-centered. The first, second, even third industrial revolution, it came with challenges, but they were mitigation based on challenges. We see how eco-friendly design has gone in hardware. We can do it as well on the internet to make it sustainable. So I will welcome my panelists to finish, to give some parting words. Just mine, I remind you, be bold, be vocal, and let's do it, let's cooperate, and thank you all. Thank you. Your turn. Well, thank you. I feel if you see in this way, like we, uh, the topic that we have come, you might have attended other sessions as well. So this topic itself, uh, getting selected and getting an opportunity to present in front of you and you opening up to say about your vision, your idea, itself speaks that we, uh, this idea is a success. And we will, I'm sure the success has already started to come out with, uh, from yourself. And with this, uh, at my, as my co-panelists have highlighted that it can be started with the small steps, you know, taking initiative from you know, making groups and that, uh, that will itself lead it to us probably in the next session, uh, next year we'll uh, be having a bigger platform to discuss upon. Thank you. Um, so I think I love I love the motivation and the points by uh, Carson, and I also agree with the points made by uh, Lily. Awareness is very important, and that is something we'll be able to uh, do with the internet, right? And at the end of the notes, there are people, so we'll be able to talk about what solutions we require, what are our concerns, and we should leverage the internet for that. Um, in addition to that, what I like to say is that there are organizations, initiatives that are working and putting in their efforts um, to create products and services that are environmentally conscious, right? And we should be identifying them and supporting them. So I think that is something we should be um, working towards um, and um, helping them grow um, moving forward. 
So I get a last say, and this is <laughs> and this is a thank you to all of you for being an engaged audience for you online. Thank you for making the time to be a part of the conversation. We've come to see that technology essentially can be helpful for mitigating what we see when we come when, it, when we talk about climate change agendas. We talk about the the negative impact of um, technology, and also can maybe be contributing to what the problem is. In all that we've said. We have made the point clear that it behoves us to start the conversation, get government, get authority, get people to be aware. And at the end of this, let us know that connecting the less, less billion, connecting the unconnected, is inherently a matter of sustainability. Thank all of you for coming. The notes will be shared with all of you. And uh, let's create some change. Thank you. We can, all, we can all come here and join us for a group picture, please. So please, let's get a group photo. And thank you very much. Arigato.